if you can manage your expectation and detach yourself from the timeline, it makes the process so much more enjoyable. Because I wholeheartedly believe, and it's served me really well in my life and a lot of our members, that people don't fail, people quit. And so if you just continue showing up more often than you don't, eventually you will get there. You are here for a reason, but navigating this human life can be challenging. How do you care for your body, mind, and spirit to make the most of your time here on earth? How can you harness your incredible human potential? In this podcast, we explore these questions and more to help you craft your best life yet. Welcome to I Am Human. beautiful humans. I'm Dr. Yami and I am your host. I am so happy to be here with you today. So welcome back to another episode of I Am Human. If you have not already, please subscribe to my podcast and also rate and review it. We would appreciate it so much and we would greatly appreciate it if you share this episode or any other episodes that you love with somebody else that you think may benefit from the information. To be human means to go extreme, go all in and potentially crash and burn. But to be human also means to find a gentler, more patient path that is sustainable and that you can do for the long term. My guest today is Maxime or Maxim Segoy. And he is the founder and CEO of Fit Vegan Coaching, a company that is on a mission to serve 10,000 people to get lean, thrive, and disease-proof their bodies on plants by 2033 and 1 million by 2050. In the past four years, they've helped over 700 plus vegans and veg curious people completely transform their body composition and health. They are one of the world's top whole food plant-based body recomposition coaching programs. Maxim is also the host of the Fit Vegan podcast and a hybrid endurance athlete demonstrating to the world what's possible when you fuel yourself with plants. And just a reminder, in this episode, we are talking about body recomposition. We're talking about Maxim's journey, which we deal with body image issues. We talk about weight. We talk about fat loss. So if this is a trigger for you, please do not listen to this episode. Go find plenty of other episodes where we do not discuss these topics. In this episode, we talk about Maxim's plant-based journey, which I was actually pretty shocked to hear. It was not what I was expecting. So it's very interesting. There was a lot to talk about there. We talk about why he's so passionate about coaching vegans. We talk about body recomposition. We talk about mindset and how it's so important when people are making some of these changes. We talk about why vegans might struggle when they're looking to build muscle and if it's possible to build muscle eating only whole plant foods. And we talk about mindset shifts that Maxim feels that people need to make to reach their goals. And he has lots of analogies and and lots of fun things that you can take away from this episode. We also talk about his athletic journey, all the different events he's done, and how his life has changed recently, what changes he's making for his own well-being and his own sustainability that's helping him reach his goals, but also helping him preserve his well-being. And this is something that I'm super interested in. I recently went to a retreat, the Lift Retreat at the Chosen Retreat Center in Sebastian, Florida, with an amazing group of people, some amazing facilitators. It was just beautiful. And one of the things I heard over and over again from me and so many other servants that were there, so many other servant-based, heart-based entrepreneurs is that we burn out. We burn out because we're doing so much. We are contributing so much in our career and in our goals that 
it becomes to the point where it's a burden and it becomes unsustainable. So I feel like I learned from Maxim some of the things that he's doing to help himself and to preserve his own well-being so he can keep going, you know, for the long run to look at the long game in this. So <clears throat> there's something I'd like to learn more about. And I am going to have some more guests on the podcast soon to talk about that because it's something that I want to learn so I can teach you and I need it for myself as well. So I really appreciate him coming on the podcast. I know you're going to love this episode because it's just super interesting. He is also a podcaster himself. So of course it was just very natural and conversational and I know you're going to love it. So thank you so much for being here again for another episode. And I hope you really enjoy this one. Now let's Welcome, Maxim Sigoy. The information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment. If you have concerns about your health or well being, please consult a healthcare professional. This podcast episode contains sensitive topics that may be triggering to certain people. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the show, Maxim Sigoy. It is so nice to have you here today. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, really happy to be here. Well, I'm excited to talk about some of these topics because I have been on a muscle building journey myself. Maybe I should Beautiful. show off some of my muscles during this episode. Um, I'm very proud of them. I'm just, I'm not going to lie. You I'm should. very proud of them. Um, but before we get into talking about muscles, I'd love to hear your story. So tell me about your vegan plant-based journey. How did you get here where we are today? Yeah, I'll try to condense it because it's been a pretty wild ride since I started. But ultimately, um, I'll start with the beginning. I grew up a farmer, right? I was very much a redneck living out in Quebec, Quebec Canada. Like we owned our own farm. We, we killed our own chicken for meat. We had cows, we had geese. We, we were living that life ultimately. Um, I was also into bodybuilding. So I used to weigh up to 240 pounds. I was really, really big, really strong. I'm, I'm 185 pounds right now, just to put it in perspective. It was a lot, a lot bigger, a lot more muscular at the time. And one day I got recruited to do high fashion modeling. Uh, there was an agent that saw me and she's like, I see something under those big chubby cheeks. She's like, try losing some weight and we'll see if we can do something with it. And so at that point, I had already competed in bodybuilding. I had done powerlifting. I had you know played basketball. I had been in a lot of those sports. And I was like, you know what? I'm willing to kind of try something new. And so after my conversation with her, she's like, you, you need to lose some weight. So I went on Google. I was like, what's the fastest way for me to lose weight and get skinny ultimately? And vegan showed up. I said, vegans are skinny and weak. I was like, well, I don't care if I'm weak. I just need to get skinny. Uh, you know, disclaimer, you can be strong and be vegan. Now I know this, but back then I didn't. I was very much the, the, you know, the bodybuilder. I was eating steak and eggs and chicken, you know, six times a day. And I was eating a dozen eggs every single day. So it was very much on the flip side. Wow. Yeah. Cholesterol was, was terrible. It was, it was egg whites, but it was still, it was still very terrible. So ultimately, um, the next day I went vegan just overnight. I was like, I'm doing this thing. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a model from now on. And so I need to get skinny. And so it was, that was almost a decade ago. So there wasn't a lot of the food options that are available now. So I was forced, thankfully, to go into whole food plant base. Uh, I think the only treat I could have at the time was tofu that was like banana flavored. And I was, I was excited to eat it because that was the only form of dessert I could get at the time. And managed to lose 80 pounds in my first year, uh, which was a lot of it was lean muscle mass that I had lost because I had stopped strength training. I just did cardio and I ate basically fruits and vegetables in a, in a massive calorie deficit every single day so that I could lose all this muscle and all this weight that I had so that I could fit in the darn sample size <laughs> that they wanted me to fit in. So that's the origin of it. Okay. Okay. That's, I did not expect to hear this story. So I'm, I'm a little bit shocked, but I want to go back because I feel like if this were to happen to a girl, maybe, I don't know, maybe you get flattered, but at the same time, it's like, you're told, okay, you need to lose weight to be a model. What was your reaction? Like, were you flattered? And, and, and I see that you adopted the diet, maybe not even in the best mindset. It was mostly like, I just want to get skinny. I just want to lose weight as fast as possible. So looking back at that, what's your reaction now going back to when that happened? 
yeah, it's, I'm still the same person I was back then is if ever there's something that I choose that would be interesting to accomplish and I want to do it, I go all in. And so to me, that went from, you know, eating a dozen eggs for breakfast, two, three chicken breasts every two hours for five additional meals per day to the next day eating a bowl of frozen blueberries, dates and bananas. I was like, it's just what I have to do to get to the new goal that I have. And that's honestly, that was the only reason why I transitioned. It's like, I have this new goal. I will do again what is necessary to get to that goal. But do you, but looking back, do you think that was a healthy mindset or perspective or have you not really thought about it that way? Um, a healthy, yes, ultimately. I think it was a lot healthier for me to transition, even if I was severely under eating and I didn't eat properly because what's the opposite? What's the alternative? I was eating a dozen eggs for breakfast and like 15 chicken breasts a day and I was loading myself on whey protein powder every single day. So just making that transition, I think was healthier, even though I was, wasn't eating enough than what I was eating before. And I still saw health benefits, right? Like my digestion cleared up, my nose cleared up, my, yeah, my skin got better. So a lot of things improved, even though I wasn't eating the proper way when I transitioned. And then what happened after that? So did you become a model for a while or did what, what happened with this 80 pound weight loss and was it worth it? Yeah. So I, yeah, actually I actually ended up, I worked in New York. I worked in Milan in Italy. Um, I was able to kind of travel the world a little bit, get some gigs, have some new experiences. And I think three years into, into the industry, I just got sick of it. It's very, it's very negative. It's a very negative space. When I was in Italy, I used the... The amount of drugs that people do to stay this skinny, I just wasn't comfortable with. I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink. I was very pure, clean. And so to me, I just basically resorted to just eating rice and running for like three hours a day to stay this skinny to compete with those people. You know, they're smoking cigarettes to suppress their appetite, you know, drinking coffee and other things that I don't want to <laughs> necessarily name on the podcast, but things that were unhealthy for them. And so they also, you can't smile in the photos. And I love smiling. I'm such a happy person. And after a while, I was like, this, this sucks. I always have to be a straight face. I have to look edgy and you know mysterious. And I was like, I, I want to be able to smile on photos. And so I just went to my agent. I was like, hey, I want to book gigs where I'm smiling. I was like, yeah, you're, you're six foot four. Um, you, there's none of that in high fashion. You're, you're built for runway, which is what I was doing at the time. So there's none of that stuff. You have to go commercial, but you're too tall to do commercial work. And so just personal anecdote, I committed to myself that I would build something that would be worthy of one day me being on a cover of magazine because I built something that served people, that impacted people's life. And I could smell a smile all I want. And so I left the modeling industry at that time for that reason. Wow. That is so fascinating. So not only are you surrounded by people that are doing whatever they can that's harmful to their bodies because they're so desperate to stay lean, you know, to look a certain way, to keep their job. But then at the same time, you can't even smile. So, you know, we already know that sometimes when you don't feel good and you force to, yourself to smile, it actually increases your yeah. endorphins and makes you feel better. So imagine the opposite where you have to go around the whole time and be like, you know, yeah. Like, yeah, like I'm just like disgruntled with life, but probably a lot yeah. of the people really are disgruntled with life because they're having to do all the drugs and not eat and they're hungry all the time. So, wow. what a, I'm so glad that you brought this up because we, in our country, in the United States, um, we romanticize leanness and looking a yeah. certain way. And and a lot of this, especially runway fashion is unattainable for the average human in a healthy, sustainable way that's going to keep them happy and have high well-being levels. Yeah. And you know, one thing to point out, a lot of women will compare themselves to the, the women that they see on the runway. And I had the opportunity to work on an international level. They're like 14, 15 years old, those girls. Right? They look older because you can do a lot of things with the makeup and, and the clothing. But yeah, they're 14, 15, 16 years old. I, I met so many girls that were traveling with their moms because they were too young to travel on their own. And the thing is, once you start to have breasts, once you start to have hips, you're out of it. You, you're deforming the clothing that you're wearing and they don't want that. So yeah, don't compare yourself to those people because you don't know what they have to do to be that skinny or what age they are to be that skinny. Yeah, that's good to point out. I know I read something that the average BMI of a runway model is like between 16 and 18. 
Um, and we know that once you start dropping lower than that, or even at some of those levels, women don't menstruate, you know? And yeah. so it's uh, it's very low, very low body fat levels. Okay. So, yeah. so you transition to a plant-based diet, vegan diet, mainly just to lose weight, to become a model, which you were successful at. Congrats for a while. You got to live that life. Thank um, you. And then you, but you maintained it after that. So why did you, why did you stick with it? And how did your attitude about this way of eating change over time? Yeah, for sure. Well, now we'll get into like the, the kind of the cancer story, the cancer side of my life. So, um, at the time where I transitioned to veganism and I wanted to get skinny, I had the opportunity to watch Forks Over Knife. And just right around that time, my grandfather got diagnosed with cancer. And as I watched a documentary and I thought about my grandfather, I was like, man, that's the things that they're saying not to do is the thing that he's been doing for many years. And now he's sick. And it really made that connection for me. I was like, man, I need to do this for myself now for health reasons, not only to be skinny, but I also want to be able to help my parents to make sure they don't get sick. And my brothers and my aunts, my uncles. And I became a hardcore preacher for, you know, the first year and a half of my life because I saw my grandfather suffer and I saw him pass away from it. And so, you know, fast forward, I did the modeling. I did all of these things. I continued to be into health and fitness, not to the extreme that I was when I was modeling. And then you fast forward several years, which would be almost eight years ago or so. Um, I meet my previous partner and we start dating. And within three months of us dating, she gets diagnosed with breast cancer. And I was 22 years old at the time when she got diagnosed. And I was like, you know what? I love her. I'm going to be there for her. I'm going to stay by her side. Um, I didn't know what this journey was going to entail and how much it would drastically shift my life. But ultimately, as she kind of went on that journey, um, she decided to heal holistically, which was, you know, her choice to kind of go down the path that she wanted to. I was there to support, right? Uh, it's not my choice as to how she should do it. I was like, hey, the only thing I'm going to recommend is consider eating whole food plant-based because there's a lot of science backing it up. There wasn't as much back then as there are now, but there was still enough for me to be able to be like, hey, this is going to be, I think it's going to be really helpful. She discovered Chris beat cancer. I don't know if you're familiar with him, Chris Work. Um, yeah, he's been on the podcast. Cool. Yeah, I recorded with him two weeks ago. Awesome guy, which had a lot of great conversation, but his resources were really helpful for her. And ultimately the doctor, when she told the doctor she's going to go whole food plan base and she wanted to like change some of her lifestyle things, the doctor was like, hey, you know, good luck if you make it a year and then kind of like laughed and walked out the office. And we're like, well, oh, we're, we're, we're not coming back here after this, right? And so ultimately she ended up living an additional almost four years on top of what was predicted. Uh, as soon as she transitioned, her inflammatory markers went down. She got a lot better. But for those of that are in the cancer space, it's expensive, especially I'm a, I'm a 22 year old that works at a smoothie bar <laughs> that never paid rent before. And now I have to get rent. I have to live with a partner. I have to take care of a partner that's dealing with cancer and I have to pay for cancer treatments. So it was a wild ride for almost five years um, until unfortunately she ended up passing away now three years ago. We just celebrated her three year anniversary. But seeing her go through that but uh, really convinced me that whole food plant-based is the way to go. But seeing the difference that it made in her health when she transitioned to eating whole food plant-based, that even solidified for me even more. And so Obviously, for me, it was locked in for health reasons, for the future. And obviously, it became about the animals throughout time and all that. But health was that main emphasis for me that really made it so that I don't want to end up in this position. I, for 24-7, saw firsthand the suffering that someone goes through. I, I It's probably 0.0001% of suffering that she went through, right? Having to actually deal with the cancer. And it was enough for me to be like, man, I don't want to go through any of that. And so I stuck to whole food plan base and now I just kind of help other people not be in that position ultimately. Yeah. Wow. What a journey. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. That sounds like it was pretty intense. So I, yeah, it was life changing. But what a, I mean, how impactful it was for you and for the work that you do. And also that you were just as a partner willing to honor her wishes, I'm sure that at times that was really scary and frustrating as well, you know, for somebody yeah. that you love. So, wow. Well, thank you for sharing that, um, sharing your journey. Tell me about why are you so passionate about coaching vegans? It sounds like that's part of it, but I know that there's even more to you as an entrepreneur and the work that you do. 
Yeah. So f- for two reasons, let's say the primary one is I want to be able to serve people to not be in her position, right? We both know that if you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you have a healthy body, right? A healthy BMI, you're active, you're greatly reducing your risk of all these chronic illnesses. And so to me, a having been always in the fitness space, I've been working out for 18 years now. So I've been, I've been in this space for a very long time. I was like, well, let me just combine this with my passion of trying to help people not get sick. So eating whole food plant based, combine the two together and help people transform. And that's kind of how basically my company came about was combining both of them. But from an entrepreneur standpoint, I love it because I get to serve cancer patients in the back end. So we donate to cancer patients every single month to support them on on their cancer journey. So whether that is with paying bills, groceries, you know, mortgage treatments, whatever it may be, because when I was going through it, I barely had any people kind of be able to to help us to that extent. I wish someone came to me and gave me a thousand dollars a month to help pay for treatments. That would have been life changing and again, potentially a different outcome if I would have been in that position. And so I like to help people on the front end from a preventative standpoint, but also on the back end, trying to serve the people that are currently going through it. Wow. That's amazing. It's amazing because you have so much empathy for that. You know exactly what it felt like and how much that can really change somebody's day, week, month, entire life. So that's amazing. Okay. Well, let's move into some of these topics. Let's talk about, I feel like this is kind of a buzz term right now, body recomposition. And in some ways, I feel like it's just a fancy way of saying you want to lose fat. But tell me in your terms, (laughs) what what does body recomposition actually mean? Yeah, to to me, it's, yeah, losing fat and building muscle, right? Because you can lose fat and you would end up looking and feeling a certain way. But I think there's a, uh, you know, a significant benefit to building more lean muscle mass, especially as you age and there tends to be a decline in lean muscle mass. And in order to build lean muscle mass, there needs to be some form of resistance training, which also brings on benefits of bone strengthening as you get older. So I work with people from like 45 to 80 years old. That's kind of my crowd that we work with. So if they're 20 and 30, you don't care about bone density yet. But <laughs> that's the reason why I bring it up. But yeah, recomposition is simply building muscle and losing fat. You should care about bone density when you're 20 though, because we can actually maximize our bone density to decrease, like, you know, if we get it to a a good peak level, because we know that after a certain age, it's going to decrease anyway. So I tell my kids, you know, my sons are 14 and 19 and I tell them whatever we can do now, they started strength training early on. Whatever we can do yeah. now to maximize that bone, the better. Then you're going to have yeah. good, strong bones for your whole life instead of like what a lot of us do is wait till we're 40 and 50 and be like, oh, heck, we need to actually think about this. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of like the earlier we start, the better. Yeah. You know how hard it is. You're trying to convince someone that's like in their 20s to, to do something for 40 years from now. It's like, I'm invincible. <laughs> I don't need to worry about this yet. <laughs> uh, my kids have no excuse to escape from their mother <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. to teaching them so, lifestyle medicine. But thankfully, they're sure. both, they love, ath- they're, they're athletes. They love it. So, so they're on board. Yeah, okay. Beautiful. What is the most important component of successful body recomposition in your opinion? So I'll, I'll go with the non-technical stuff because the technical stuff we can resistance training, protein, all these things. But uh, ultimately, your 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 mindset would be the biggest one because you know I don't have a piece of paper with me because we're digital. But I I could give you the best meal plan in the world, the best workout plan in the world, and your body won't change and your health won't change if you don't stick to it, right? I always like to be upfront with people. I am a coach. I'm not a magician. <laughs> so it's not because you hold the piece of paper that it changes everything. So ultimately, I would say the mindset. And that's such a hard one for, for people to navigate. Some people get there because they got the cancer diagnosis. They had the heart attack. And they're like, I really need to change my life. I need to do something. Some people had a cancer scare or a health scare. Some people are just you know kind of healthy, but kind of not healthy. And they're in that middle place where they want to do something, but they're not, there's no fire under their butt yet to kind of take action. So I think the biggest part is, is actually committing to it, which means not being perfect on the journey, but accepting that there will be imperfection, but that regardless of the imperfection, you will continue to move forward. I'd say that's the biggest thing. 
That's exactly what I wanted you to say, because I agree <laughs> for any, <laughs> any kind of behavior change, any of these things, it really is your mindset's the most important because we have so much good information out there. And like most people have probably heard, you know, when it comes to there, there's a lot of different paths you can take, but it's for all sure. about sticking to it. And I think one of the most important things with mindset is patience knowing yeah. that it's probably going to take longer than you think it is because it will. we all, we all, we, we want Amazon prime. You know what? Yeah. We want things in two days and we're frustrated if it doesn't happen in two days, but it's going to take longer than you think. So you really need to just stick with it. If you fall off, get right back on and just keep going one foot in front of the other. Cause I think a lot of us have this all or nothing. We're just going to grind really hard and, you know, try to lose as much weight or do something really quick. And then go back to our old ways. And it's just like this stop, start, stop, start sort of attitude yeah. towards changing our, our behaviors and our habits. Yeah. If I can tie that into an analogy, I'm a man of many analogies. Let's just <laughs> go down a rabbit hole with that. But <laughs> let, let's just compare it to, to investing money, right? With people showing up. So every time that you invest money into it, that's you showing up, that's you doing a workout, that's you eating a healthy meal, that's you doing the right thing towards the direction that you want to go towards. Who's going to have more money at the end of like 20 years from now? Me, if I put a dollar every single day or you, if you put a hundred dollars every three months, right? The compounding effect yeah. of me putting a dollar every single day will far beat you putting some money every once in a while, uh, every month, right? And so people think that they need to do the, these big grandiose actions that everything needs to be perfectly aligned so that they can do their meal plan and stick with it or go to the gym and everything goes smoothly. The reality is the person that is doing a quarter of the action, a tenth of the action, but small actions every single day, that's going to compound over time to them getting to where they want to. Mm -hmm. Consistency over perfection. I feel yeah. like what most people are doing is putting $300 in and then taking $250 out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And taking $250 out. <laughs> Why is my money not going up? <laughs> yeah. Or they put money and they're like, I'm good for a year. I got to, you know, let me just wait a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's talk about vegans in particular. What do vegans struggle with the most when they are looking to build muscle? Do you feel like there is a vegan specific thing or, or is it just like an everybody thing when it comes to building muscle? Yeah, for sure. I, I would say I don't want to sound like the, the bodybuilder, protein, 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 but you know, there's a lot of studies showing that you do need a slightly more protein if your goal is to shift your body composition. If your goal is to just be healthy and you don't really care about your body composition, you can be light and be healthy and, and have a phenomenal life. Don't worry about protein. Focus on diversity, right? Eat as much as you want, follow all these, all these things. If your goal is to specifically manipulate how your body looks, then there needs to be an emphasis put on it. And I think a lot of studies are more around the 1.6 gram per kg of body weight, which is really low and a lot lower than most recommendations from the meat world, if you will, right? All the articles you see about muscle, it's like almost half of the recommendation ultimately. Um, because if you're going to be strength training or resistance training and tearing down those muscle fiber, there needs to be that opportunity for it to be repaired with those building blocks, which are amino acids, which come from the protein content. So when I, a lot of vegans struggle with it, I'm just going to compare it to whole food plant-based vegans. Because if you're consuming like junk vegan food, you can grab fake sausages and all of these things and you're going to consume enough protein. Because when you go whole food plant-based, it tends to be more challenging. So I'll give an example. I had a client when he came in, he was eating, I think like four sweet potatoes with some almond butter and some cinnamon and like a massive salad on the side. I was like, hey, that's a, you know, a fairly healthy meal. So I'm like, what if we do two sweet potatoes instead of four and we put half a block of tofu in there? right? And have your salad and your two sweet potatoes. So just about changing the proportion of the meals sometime that's going to allow you to get a little bit more protein in. And so, because yeah, if I eat all I want, I, and I am not aware of body composition, I'm going to eat a ton of mangoes and dates and water. Like I'm not going to get any protein in if I just listen to what I want to eat. And so I think it's just putting a little bit more of an awareness or a focus on consuming a little bit more protein. Thanks for making that, um, you're distinguishing that between the people who are specifically looking to build muscle and the people who are just like, whatever, I just want to, you know, eat in a sustainable way. And I'm not super concerned about building extra muscle. Although I will say, especially for women, the older we get, 
the more you probably should be considering putting on a little extra muscle. And I know that women are always worried that as soon as they lift a a dumbbell, they're going to get quote bulky. Believe you me, that's not going to happen. I work out real hard and I do (laughs) not look bulky. Okay. Like, and I think sometimes we see these images and there are some women that compete. I suspect that some of them are probably doing steroids. (laughs) Yeah. They're not just (laughs) eating food. (laughs) It's not just food. So don't worry, lift the weights. It's good for you. But I will say that I think that there is a difference there that people shouldn't get too stressed if they're not specifically looking to build muscle that they have to be like, you know, super conscious about the amount of protein. But whenever you coach your clients, are you trying to get them to stick predominantly to whole whole foods, all whole foods? I mean, what about using things like TVP or, you know, some of protein powders? Do any of your clients use that? Or how do you try to help them get the amount of protein that they need to build that extra muscle? Yeah, for sure. So I think the the primary sources that we go for, like tofu, tempeh, natto, edamame, lentils, beans, and then you fall into things that have a little bit less protein, like the grains and then kind of the nuts and seeds in a, in a more a smaller quantity. So we tend to stick primarily to all of these whole foods. Um, we don't really use seitan, even though some members like to kind of add it for themselves. Uh, personally, I have a hard time with it. It doesn't suit my stomach too great. So we don't have seitan. We don't really use TVP. Um, we do have some protein powders, but they are, I say, quote unquote, whole food protein powders. They're hemp based. So if you're familiar with the, I, I used to work in the in the supplement industry. So basically, if you cold press hemp seeds, you get hemp oil, and then the meal that's left over, that's pretty much hemp protein. So it's a crushed hemp seed as your protein. It's as whole food as you'll get for a a plant-based protein powder. So I like to use a hemp-based protein powder. Um, And yeah, that's pretty much it. The rest is just food. Awesome. Good. That feels really good to be able to eat all whole foods. It's good for your your body. Yeah. Um, So I guess that was my next question. Is it possible to build muscle eating only whole plant foods? Because I feel like there's this argument too that you have to use protein powders or other concentrated sources of isolated proteins in order to get enough protein. Yeah. So it, you can definitely do it without protein powder. It is definitely a lot more work for you to figure out a way to make that fit in, right? Because at the end of the day, when we talk about body composition, there's a conversation of calories. You know, if I burn 3000 calories a day and I consume, I wouldn't be able to, but if I was to consume 5000 calories of fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds, I I would put on some body fat. There's a little bit too much coming in for my body can handle. And so the game is as you kind of do create a little bit of a calorie deficit to be able to shift your body uh, composition positively. Well, you technically have less of a, a budget to hit your amount of protein. And so instead of having two sweet potatoes and a salad and half a block of tofu, it might look like having, you know, the salad without nuts and seeds on top of it, uh, one sweet potato and a half with no almond butter, and then three quarters of a block of of tofu instead, or half a block of tempeh. So it's just, you have to change the proportions even more of your meals to be even more, even higher in protein if you want to do it without some form of, of protein powder. But it's definitely doable for sure. Yeah. We kind of hit on this a little bit, but maybe you have some other thoughts. What mindset shift is essential for people to make to reach their goals? And this could be any goal within, you know, the fitness, body recomposition, whatever. But what do you feel is uh, an essential mindset shift? Well, I got a few for you. That's what I'm known for within within the, the program. So one of them is, like you mentioned, it'll take a lot longer than you think it will. And deta- if you can manage your expectation and detach yourself from the timeline, it makes the process so much more enjoyable because I wholeheartedly believe, and it's served me really well in my life and a lot of our members, that people don't fail, people quit. And so if you just continue showing up more often than you don't, eventually you will get there, right? And that applies to, to fitness and any relationship, right? If you show up for less than half of the time for your partner, guess what? You won't have a good relationship. You probably not have a partner <laughs> at the end of it. So show up more often than you don't. And I promise you, eventually you will get to the place where you reach your goal. The other one is we talk progression over perfection. Because I don't know what it is with fitness and transformation, but people seem to have this idea that it's just going to go smoothly. That they'll always stick to their nutrition. That they'll always get their workout in. Listen, life will happen. There's going to be emergencies with kids, with business. There's going to be travel. There's going to be holidays. 
Like it's not going to go perfectly. And so expect it to not go, per, uh, not go perfectly. And then whenever something does happen, which causes you to potentially go off track from the, the journey that, you, you were been, that you've been on, all I tell my clients is just win the next meal, win the next workout. If you miss a workout, just win the next one. If you miss a meal or you, you binge eat, we have a lot of, I had an issue with binge eating from my modeling days. If you binge eat and you eat 2000 calories of chocolate cake on Thursday night for dessert, guess what I would tell you? Hey, hope it was good. Hope you had a good time. Just eat your breakfast on Monday. Because a game of trying to compensate with trying to cut your calories or do more exercise just leads you to have an unhealthy relationship with food and exercise. And it's a vicious cycle that's really hard to get out of. So yeah, progression over perfection, consistency compounds, like we talked about for investing earlier, and ultimately showing up more often than you don't. And eventually you're going to be able to get there. Yeah, I love that. That's so true. Um, So we're going to talk about athletic pursuits a little bit. I'm training for my first half Ironman. So I feel oh, nice. like I've been interviewing a lot of people that have been that have done Ironmans or half Ironmans before. So you can give me your tips in a little bit because I'm afraid I'm going to drown during the swim part. But yeah. training for this event has like literally changed my life because it has taught me so much about tolerating monotony. Like yeah. it is hella boring yeah. to like <laughs> do some of these long training rides and and. It's, it's taught me to tolerate the monotony in order to get the results I want. And I feel that that's the same way when it comes to body re- recomposition, because like, we just have to be honest, sometimes it just gets boring. I mean, you're doing yeah. your meal prep. It's like, yeah, I would rather just, you know, relax and just have whatever, you know, anytime I want, but that's not going to help me reach my goals. So it's all about that long game, like tolerating that monotony planning in, you know, your little treats and things like that to fit within what you, what you're needing for your meal plan. But, but just knowing you just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and you're going to get there, going to cross that finish line eventually, and it's going to pay off. (laughs) So that I feel like it's really taught me a lot about that because it really, I think that's one of the big things for a lot of people is they just get bored. Like it's exciting at the beginning. You're like, Hey, this is new. This is fun. I'm seeing results. And then there's going to be a long time in between where it's just kind of boring. Yeah. Well, you know, you talked about the Amazon Prime effect earlier. To me, I, I, I feel, I think of it on the opposite side, the emotion that it evokes. So I just call it the honeymoon phase, right? So when you start your triathlon training, you're probably super excited. And at one point it got boring. If you start a fat loss journey, at first, like, oh, it's a new workout. I got my new gym outfits, my new gym membership. I got my containers for my food. You're ex- and at one point you're like, God, oh, this kind of sucks. I've been doing this for a while now, right? But the whole point is that if it's if it is a for example fat loss or training for a triathlon if it is something that you want to do for the long run you have to do it long enough for it to be a part of your identity once it becomes a part of your identity it, it's not about the excitement or the lack of excitement it just is who you are and it is no longer work for you to do these things right and so it's it takes time to kind of get to that place right um, but yeah, if, do you want advice on the training or the swim well, or any of these things? Let's we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I want to go back real quick. Cause there's something I'm curious about. I still want to get a little bit more out of you about this. So, cause I'm still thinking about in my head, this whole modeling thing. Yeah. Um, and, and what you think about body image in general, like, yeah. do you feel like at this point in your life, after you've gone through that whole journey with the modeling and everything, do you struggle with your body image? And what do you see in your clients and how do you help them as far as body image and how that changes over time? And especially being vegans, I feel like we have more pressure to look a certain way. What are your thoughts on that? Great question. So I used to have a terrible relationship with my body image from the bodybuilding days because, you know, you go down, I went down to like 4% body fat. And so it kind of becomes your, your new standard, your new point of reference. Every time you put on a little bit of weight, you refer back to this image of yourself, which was extremely unhealthy. And you're like, well, I'm fat now because I'm not 4% body fat. <laughs> it's absurd, right? No one needs to live at 4%. You can't live at 4% body fat. So it took me a really long time to heal that relationship with my body. Like after my bodybuilding show, I didn't share this earlier, but I went down to 4% body fat. I was a hundred, how much? I was like 165 pounds, I think. And I'm six foot four. And I gained 50 pounds, 50 pounds in a month. Within 30 days, I put on 50 pounds of fat after the show. I went from 
six pack to having man boobs. Like the, if I can say that words, but yeah, that's, that was literally the, the transformation I had within 30 days after my show. And that was because I just couldn't stop eating. I had been restricting myself for four months and now I just want to eat everything I could. I couldn't, there was no, there was no hole. I could never feel the hole ultimately. And it led me to gain a ton of weight, which took me, I think three years to start to improve my relationship with food and figure out a new way of losing weight. And this new way of losing weight is kind of how I built my program because I don't want people to have a bad relationship with food. Now I'm in a place where I have a more body fat than some of the six pack photos you're going to see online. But I've done over 20 transformations for myself of like doing a muscle building phase and a fat loss phase, muscle building phase. And I discover that when I go really high in my muscle building phase, I'm a little bit more body fat. So I say chunkier is my favorite word, but I'm a little bit chunkier. I, I just, I'm, I'm out of breath. I feel lethargic. I feel heavy. Like the stairs are rough. It's just a little bit too much. And when I get really lean, I, I'm exhausted. There's not enough energy through food that's coming in to, to maintain this level of leanness. Uh, my sex drive goes away. I don't have as much cardiovascular capacity. So I found that if I just bump up by maybe like five or 10 pounds from that low level, I feel like Superman, I can do everything and I have so much energy. So to me, having more body fat makes me actually feel really good. So I got to this place now where I'm comfortable with the place that I'm at. So it took, but it took me, oh, it took me years to get to that place. I love how you went back to the wisdom of your body though. So yeah. instead of, I want to, I, I don't care how I feel. I, I want to look this way, damn it. You're more like, okay, yeah, maybe it's nice to look that way, but I, I want to feel good. I want to feel like I have energy and this is the right balance for me. And I think yeah. ultimately that's the most important thing is for people to be able to tune in and not just focus on what they look like, you know? So yeah, makes me think of the Jim Carrey quote. I, I, he's like, I wish everyone could be rich and famous to figure out that there's nothing to it. I wish everyone could just snap their fingers and have a six pack to see that there's nothing special about it. I mean, I, I'm not convinced of what you're <laughs> saying right now. <laughs> but yeah, but I've been there for me. I've been there over, over 10 times and I've lived yeah. at that state. There's nothing special. Like you can have a flat stomach. You'll feel way better with a flat stomach than you would with a six pack for sure. Yeah. No, it, it, it's a whole nother level to have a six pack. I will never have a six pack and I'm not aspiring to have a six pack, but it, it's funny how we use that as like a metric, right? Like it's, yeah. it's almost like in the back of everybody's mind, kind of a dream, like, Oh, it'd be so nice to have a six pack, but it takes a lot of effort to get there for most people. Some people like my youngest son, he's just so naturally lean, um, yeah. that it's probably just going to be super easy for him. But for a lot of people, it's not. I feel like for for people, I think they have a bigger attachment to the number on the scale than the actual image of their body. At least that's been my experience throughout the years. So if let's just say someone weighs 180 pounds and they want to weigh 150 pounds and I, and I would go to them and I'd be like, Hey, Samantha, if I were to snap my fingers, give you exactly the body that you want, but you weighed a hundred, you were 10 pounds heavier than the goal you have in your mind. Would you be happy? majority of people will say no. Even though wow. I give them exactly what they want, the number on the scale is not a reflection of the, the, their expectation. Wow. And so I think people are more attached to the number on the scale than they are to how they look and how they feel. Because I can say 150 pounds right now, and that's overweight for someone, and that's severely underweight for someone else. It means nothing to no one. It's different for everyone. And so, yeah, changing that relationship to self versus you know a number on the scale. Ugh, that is, I'm so glad you said that. That is so important to know. It is kind of sad because we do, we have this fixation, but even two people with the same height, but different body types yep. can look completely different at the same weight, completely different. And just like we were talking with this body recomposition, when you build more muscle, you can look completely different at different weights, you know, at the yep. same weight. So yeah. it's, um, it's all about body composition too, but yeah, it's, it's sad that we're so stuck on numbers. And I think the same thing goes for clothing sizes and things like that. And I wish that more people would along the journey, pay attention to how they feel, how, you know, what their relationship with food is, how sustainable it is in their life, how much they're able to do the activities they like to do. Um, cause I think that's the most important because 
you know, what, who cares? I mean, what the number is. And actually that number is fluctuating all day long anyway. So you're not like the the exact same number all day. It's like this random thing that you step on the scale and then five minutes later after you eat, it's going to be completely different, you know? So. Yeah. It's, it's always, always fluctuating. I weigh myself daily just for documentation purposes. So I can go online and kind of show the different things. I'm never the same weight every day. I'm always, always going to fluctuate. Even if I do and I eat the same thing and I stop eating at the same time and I stop drinking water at the same time, it always fluctuates. You can sneeze too hard and be two pounds heavier. It's crazy. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. Okay, so let's talk about athletic pursuits. So tell me, what yeah. is a hybrid athlete? Yeah, so it's someone that's able to have some stre- strength but also have some endurance, All right. So if you look at a lot of endurance athletes, a lot of them tend to be more on the skin your side. If you're going to ask them to do, you know, 10, 20 pull-ups or deadlift a certain amount of weight or squat heavier weights, they wouldn't be able to to handle it. But on the flip side, if you ask a bodybuilder to do a bodybuilder workout, he'll do great. And you ask him to go on a run for 10 kilometers, he's going to die halfway through. And so it's someone that's able to do both ultimately. So it's more like a, a master generalist, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, I consider myself a hybrid athlete too, but I'm also, I'm like one of those people that I can't, it's like, I want to do everything, you know? And I used to not like strength training and then I just, I fell in love with it. And now it's like, I have to lift four times a week. I don't, I do not feel right if I don't. Where in the past, it was such a chore. It was like, oh, this is so hard. That's how I feel about abs actually. Like I still can't get into working my abs specifically because I started more with the power lifting. But yeah. it's funny how that can change, but I love endurance too. Like that's so fun for me. So it's nice to be able to have a category where you fit in because you're not just in one camp or the other. You're kind of crossing over into both camps. Yeah. Um, so tell me a, a little bit about your athletic journey and the different things you've done. And I'd love to know if you have any events coming up that you're training for. For sure. I, you're going to love my answer for the events I have coming up. Um, so I've done, I think, three half Ironmans. I've probably done over 20 triathlons, so Olympic distance, sprint distances. Um, I've competed in bodybuilding. I've competed. I've, I've done some powerlifting. Um, I've done a bunch of Spartan race. I have a, a bunch of my medals back here because I forget sometimes. I did martial arts nice. as well. I got some basketball tournaments in there. Yeah, I, I got a, I got quite a few, quite a few things back there. But one of them that I'm the most proud of that got me into endurance sports is actually cycled from Vancouver, Canada to San Francisco, California. Wow! So that was back in the time where my my late partner was going through a cancer journey. I was like, man, I need to raise money to pay for treatment because I can't work enough to kind of do that. So I'm like, I need to do something crazy and just go public with it and raise money. And I was like, but I can't, I don't want to do it just for her. So I found four other cancer patients that needed help financially. And I honestly had the idea and a month later I was gone. I'm not a cyclist. I don't come from this world. I was a, I come from the world of bodybuilding. And so I would go to the gym every day and cycle trying to get ready for it. I found sponsor, sponsors. I found a bike and I literally biked with my panties. I would camp at night. I cook my food. I'd bike another hundred kilometers. I camp at night in my tent. And I just did that for 22 days. And I was able to raise several thousands of dollars and to kind of spread it out throughout the cancer patients. And I was like the most rewarding thing. That'd be any race. But that's what got me into uh, into triathlon ultimately was that bike ride. Oh, man. You you are kind of one of those people. You, go big or go home. <laughs> I like your yeah. style. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you learn along the way. When I got to San Francisco, I was actually fit enough to do the bike ride. <laughs> the whole- You're like, I, I trained for the bike ride during the bike ride. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. All right. So what are you training for right now? Nothing. This nothing. is the first year that I do nothing. <laughs> yeah. So nice. you know, we want to talk about health and being in tune with your body. You know, you know, if you, you know, you, you have a, you have a career, if you work really hard for 30 days straight, crazy hours, and then you just take a day off to rest, you're going to get sick, right? For the most part, most people get sick. And then like their body's basically trying to be like, Hey, you need to calm down and relax a little bit. And you're sick for a few days and then you go back to me. I was 22 years old when my late partner got diagnosed with cancer. I had five years of extremely stressful 24 seven, you know, waking up to screams in the middle of the night, like treatments, hospital, all that. And then she passed away. And then I went into escapism. I moved to Tulum, Mexico. I moved in different places. And this past January, I um, I got married to my wife, Ivy. And Congrats. that was my when I got, thank you. When I got married, my body just like relaxed. That was a one day off after eight years of go, go, go. 
And then I just started to be like, I'm tired. I just I can't recover. I can't train. And so I had a meeting with uh, Dr. Laura Marbus, who's a great friend of mine. And I was like, hey, I think you just like, you're at that point where you just need to relax for an extended period of time. And so I had a, I had a marathon schedule. I had a half Ironman schedule. I had a bunch of Spartan races. I had a long cycling ride. I had a swim competition scheduled. I canceled everything. And for the first time in my life, I'm just resting, focusing on serving people and being with my wife. And I'm taking this whole year off from racing. So I'm still training, but nothing. <laughs> I love it. No, th- this is such a good message because I feel like some of us, we do use our sports as a way to escape too, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, I love it. And I feel this is the most I've ever trained in my life. I've never trained this hard ever in like my entire life. So I don't have as many things scheduled as you did. So I'm, I don't go that far. But I will say with my work, <clears throat> is very similar in that if I take some time off, it's almost like I don't want to come back because I got out of that routine of working so hard that you just, you're just in that, you know, in the treadmill and you're like working so hard, you didn't notice it. And then you go away from it and you're, you're like, Oh my gosh, (laughs) I don't know if I can do it. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate what you're saying is that sometimes we just need to take a step back, let that cortisol come down because we've had yeah. it so high for so long. And it feels really good though. Are you feeling good taking some time off? For sure. And ultimately this year I'm, I'm taking a week, uh, sorry, a full seven days off from work and s- social media. So no electronic devices for seven days, every two months. So I've already done it twice so far this month and it's phenomenal. Every time I come back, I'm even more and more rested. And, you know, just to address what you said about using it as a form of escapism, that's what I did it when my partner was sick at the time. I was like, eh, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't touch that stuff. To me, I was like, if I can numb myself on the bike for four hours or in a pool for two hours, I don't have to think or stress about anything. This is great. And that's kind of, that's kind of how I got into it. But now I got to the place where I've dealt with a lot of my trauma. I've dealt with a lot of my things. And for me personally, I'm like, I don't need to run away from anything. So I'm just hey, I'm just going to not try to compete this year. So it's a, it's been a crazy journey to evolve to this point. I love it. I love that. So it sounds like you're taking really good care of yourself. And what a good example to set for the rest of us. So maybe someday I'll be on this side saying the same thing. I think it's going to take me a few years though. I'm not there yet. Yeah. Okay. But I had, some health, I had some health stuff that kind of came up at the beginning of the year. And I, when I spoke with Laura, I was like, man, I don't want to give myself cancer out of trying to help other people have cancer, not have yeah. cancer. I was yeah. like, it doesn't make sense to me. So I better take care of myself first. You know, that's so important to remember. When it comes to lifestyle medicine, you know, we're always putting food first and saying how important food is. It's so important. But the effect that our mind has on our body And some of the choices that we make, whether we're anxious all the time, you know, that stress level is high all the time, that harms us too. So it's really about being comprehensive in our approach to health. You know, it's not just the food, it's the sleep, it's the stress management, it's the connection, which I think for a lot of us overworking work addicts, sports addicts, we do so much of this stuff. We don't even have time to hang out with people. <laughs> so it's got no friends, just work and, you know, exercise all the time, you know? And so I think it's really important to look at our lives comprehensively and holistically and say, where are these areas that we may not be optimizing for our health because it all affects us inside. It's really, really important to remember that. What do you wish more people knew? Um... I, well, I wish more people would get to experience the benefit of eating whole food plant-based. I wish more people, you know what? I wish if I could, if I always say this, uh, you familiar with Tony Robbins? Mm-hmm. Of course. Okay. So we were just in Hawaii for a trip with him and a, a group of people. And we talked about like superpowers for some reason. I was like, man, if I could have a superpower, it would be to have the ability to switch that brain the, the, the flip in people's head of like, to kind of get that news that they have cancer, that they had a heart attack, but without actually having the consequences of it. Like just to get that like fear in them to get them to change. And so I think the message is like, whatever you think is worth it, it's not. Because once you're sick, whatever you thought was worth it, you absolutely don't care. 
right? Money, work, career, business, house, clothes, trips. You you just want your health back. And I got this kind of I got to experience it firsthand. And it was just, yeah, it woke me up. It really woke me up. Like she was like, I just want to be able to walk outside with you. And I was like, she can't even come in and walk outside with me. That's crazy. Right. And I'm here, I'm trying to make all this money so I can pay for the treatments and stress about all these things. And it just brings you down to the core basics of life. So yeah, whatever you think is worth it, it's not. Eat your vegetables. Your mom was right. Uh, I love that. How do you define success in this lifetime? I think, so I'll put it this way. I think everyone's here for a different reason. And so don't use my answer as a means to kind of inspire your answer. I think I was put on this earth to serve people to the largest extent that I can on a really high scale. It's been inside of me since I was a kid. I've been trying to do it since I was a kid. This is the first time that it's this successful. Um, but yeah, for me, it's just if I can serve as many people as I can, and I know that I tried my best doing it. That's the part, right? But like, how can I serve people to the best that I can while being able to build a beautiful family? Because I could just try to serve and work all the time and not have a family and get divorced and go down the path that a lot of business people go down on, right? But I want to be able to have a beautiful family. I want to be able to be healthy and serve people to the highest extent that I can to not end up in this position. I don't think that I went through all these life challenges and all these obstacles to not work in this space. Yeah. And so that's what success looked like for me. Yeah. Serve others, but without neglecting yourself. Yeah. Serve others while also maintaining your own well-being, your joy, you know, and and enjoy the life that you want, which for you sounds like it's family, spending time with the people you love. And I think we can do both. And just you're learning to do that. You're learning how to optimize your well-being, but also serve at a high level, which I admire. So I'm going to learn from you. <laughs> okay. So one of my favorite questions, is there a goal or a dream that has evaded you so far? Or is there something that you have on your bucket list that you would like to share with us? Yeah, well, I'd say the, that has evaded me. I am working towards it and it's a pretty lofty one, which is to help 10,000 people get lean, thrive, and reduce, reduce the risk of chronic illnesses by 2033 and a million by 2050, right? We're, we're nearing over 800 people and it's almost been four years that we've been doing this. So it's been exponential every year, but it's, I have to work more. <laughs> like I have to put better systems in place to be able to serve more people. And then uh, on my bucket list, I don't know why, but hike Kilimanjaro. I have no idea why it's on there, but it's just always been there. And so I want to be, we're, we're putting um, some money aside to be able to go, my wife and I, next year when I'm allowed to, to travel. Nice. So how hard is it to, to climb Kilimanjaro? I don't know very much about that mountain. Like, is that one that you need guides and you're going to need to have oxygen and all that kind of stuff? Uh, I, maybe you need oxygen, but for sure you have Sherpa, you have Sherpas with you. you I, I, most people, that's what they do. They don't care them. But I think it's like, there's like seven or 11 days round trip for, for some of them. Um, in terms of hardness, I don't know. I just sign up for it and I do it and I show up kind of like biking to <laughs> San Francisco. That's how like, you roll. That's how you yeah. roll. <laughs> like I, I, I personally believe that I, I personally believe that you could do a full Ironman right now if you wanted to. If I put, you know, if I put something that made you fear your life behind you in a boat while you're swimming, you would find a way to get out of that water and swim the whole distance. If I put a line behind you while you're biking, you would find a way to bike the full distance. You know what I mean? So we have it in us. Now, will you feel great once you're done? You'll probably not be able to move for two weeks, but you have <laughs> it in you. So to me, that's how I see it. I can do anything I want. Am I going to feel great after? I don't know, but I did it. So <laughs> I'll train for it, obviously, but I know that I can do it. I just have to show up. Yeah, I love it. That's one of the best way to manifest your desires too. Like it's like in your mind, it's already accomplished. Now yeah. I'm just going to focus on having fun while I'm doing it. Like, I mean, that's the best way to manifest your desire. So I think you're a master manifester. You, you know you. what you want and then you go after it and you get it. The learning to be focused because I've always been in the belief that I can do anything that I want and it became debilitating at one point because then it was like, how do I choose what's the thing that I want to accomplish? And then I started different businesses, different projects. And then I was like, this year, this year's focus is 2024. The theme is focus. So yeah. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I love it. That's great. I have I, I don't have much focus either. I'm I'm a shiny objects kind of girl. I and the problem is that I have such a high path high capacity to accomplish things that it's difficult not to keep putting more things on my plate. But I'm learning that that's not sustainable. So, um, what does it mean to be human? That's a big question. Um, honestly, which just from kind of where I'm at in my life right now and the lessons that I'm learning, um, just accepting that you can't have everything under control and that you have to, what's it like to be human? Being, being human is like being like water, just flowing through the things that are presented at you. Because if you're trying to control, hold back, restrict, attach yourself to old identity, you just get left behind. I think that's where most suffering and trauma comes from. And when you're trying to rush things, that's where I think most, a lot of damage or things come from. So yeah, just being like water, just flowing with it, which I'm getting better at, but I still suck at it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's true because the number one rule is that things are going to change. No matter yeah. what, your emotions are going to change. Your your body's constantly changing. You're getting older. Your wisdom, your experience, the world around you. It's like a moving, you know, board. Like everything is changing constantly. So if you're always trying to control things, that leads to more stress. So I think that's a great way to view it. Is like be flexible, enjoy the ride, have fun, but don't be so attached to everything. Which I think. Most of us are the opposite. We, we are attached. We want to stay mm. young. We want to stay beautiful. We, we want things to be happy all the time. We never want to be sad. Um, we, of course, never want to lose anybody we love. We want to have all of that stable all the time. But life, unfortunately, is going to throw us the opposite. Yeah. Wow. What a great conversation, Maxim. Thank you so much. You have been an amazing guest. I have loved hearing your journey and all of your insights and your wisdom. If you can please tell my listeners where they can connect with you and what products and services you offer and how they can get in touch with you about that. Yeah, for sure. Well, first I'll say thank you very much for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I always love when there's a great line of questioning and gets to open doors that never get open. So I think you did a really good job. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, and so for the people, um, I'm on every platform. Honestly, if you just go to fitvegancoaching.com, you scroll all the way at the bottom, there's a link to my Instagram, there's a link to my YouTube, there's a link to the podcast. I have a podcast as well, which you know would love to have you on uh, as a guest. So yeah, just everything is on fitvegancoaching.com. Perfect. That makes it easy. And if somebody is interested in working with you, they just go to your website and yeah, contact you that way. Yeah, if you go to fitvegancoaching.com, you just go on there and you can fill out your uh, an intake form and it'll give you kind of custom recommendations of what we think would be best suited for you from the coachings that, that we offer. Um, you know, we're one of the top ones in the world for whole food, um, plant-based body recomposition. And uh, we're backed by incredible doctors like Dor Dr. Lori Marbus and she's on our team as well. So you get to kind of work with her and talk with her. So yeah, fitvegancoaching.com. Everything's on there. I made it simple. Perfect. Okay. Well, that'll be easy. Well, Maxim, thank you so much for everything. Thank you for all the work that you do and all the love and compassion that you're putting out into the world and how many people you're helping. We appreciate it so much and appreciate learning from you today. I'm definitely going to take some of these things. And now I'm just like, wow, a week off every two months sounds amazing. I, I want that. So I I'm going to put that into my vision board for the future. So thank you for everything. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Thank you. My name is Maxim Siguin and I am human. Thank you for listening to another episode of I Am Human. I would be so honored if you subscribe to the podcast so that you never miss an episode. We love our listeners and take your feedback seriously. If you have questions or constructive feedback, you can email us at podcast at dryami.com. That's podcast at d-o-c-t-o-r-y-a-m-i.com. I am your host, Dr. Yami Gasorla Lancaster. I Am Human is produced by myself and Alejandra Parra. Graphics designed by Alejandra Parra. Music by Angela Soph with Glowbox Productions and edited by the Castos Production Team. 
Remember, human, you are here for a reason. Have fun, explore, and live your life to the fullest.